Good morning, everyone. Thank you for spending your Friday morning with us here. Uh, so today we have the MAA invited lecture and Dr. Vilma Mesa speaking with us. So I have the pleasure and privilege of introducing her. So I'll tell you a bit about her. We could go on for a long time. So Dr. Vilma Mesa is professor of mathematics education, jointly appointed in the math department and the School of Education at the University of Michigan. She is also a faculty associate at the Center for the Study of Higher and Post-Secondary Education at the University of Michigan. She received her, received her PhD and MA from the University of Georgia. But prior to that, prior to her career in education, uh, she worked in Columbia and used her degrees in computer science and mathematics from the University of Los Andes in Bogota to work in systems management. Her prolific research career investigates the role that resources play in developing teaching expertise in undergraduate mathematics, specifically at community colleges and in inquiry-oriented learning, excuse me, inquiry-based learning communities. She currently serves as Associate Editor for Educational Studies in Mathematics, which is one of our top and most prestigious uh, journals in our field. And she's on the editor editorial board for several other journals. She was a Fulbright Scholar in 2016 and worked with the University of Santiago de Chile. In addition to her NSF Early Career Award in 2009, she's been PI or co-PI on over $5 million in NSF or IES Science Awards and she has published over 40 articles in math education. As this very brief summary hopefully makes clear, Vilma is a force. She's a longtime member of the research and undergraduate mathematics education community, and she's currently serving as the treasurer on the executive board of the Sigma On Room. And it's in this capacity I've gotten to know her heart and her compassion for others even more. She's a true advocate for people in all ways. Finally, I do recommend that if you get a chance, you hang out with her at international conferences. Her curiosity about and appreciation for other cultures is a joy to witness and it's been fun to travel with her and experience um, other aspects of this wonderful world together. So it's our privilege to hear her words today. Thank you. Um, hello, yeah, so it's working. Oh, Megan, thank you. <laughs> thank you for the kind words, uh, words that you used. Um, I am very happy uh, to be here this morning. Um, I really want to thank whomever in the conference who invited and proposed my name and whomever said, yes, that's a good choice. And I, I really um, agreed to do it really fast because I was so excited, like, oh, my God, that is amazing. And then I watched some of the invited addresses, <laughs> YouTube, and then I said, oh, my God, what did I see? What did we just did? Um, so I have been fretting about this presentation, <laughs> you can imagine, uh, but I'm uh, very thrilled. I, um, I hope you will find something here that may invite you to rethink how you do your everyday practice. Um, I will go, I'll be talking about two separate lines of work, one related to mathematics instruction and the other related to the use of mathematics textbooks in post-secondary settings. Um, these two separate lines of work are now intertwined in a project that the NSF uh, funded, and I'm going to be talking about it also at the end. Um, before I start, I do want to ask to acknowledge that we are in Denver, and Denver is on land inhabited by various indigenous communities, the Arapaho, Comanche, Soshone, the Ute, among others and that there are about 7,000 indigenous people living and thriving here in Denver today. Move. Should be moving. It was working this morning. Um, hmm. Okay, let's try this. No? All right, so this is not advancing. So I don't know what happened. Um, huh. So I'm having a technical issue with the... We tried it, swear it. Shall I use mine? It looks like it's not.
Yay. No. I wonder what it is. Ha ha. We found a problem. Okay. All right. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, I'm going to try to stay with my script because it's a long talk and I, I need to make sure that I put everything in the time that was allotted to me. So um, I investigate how uh, resources, instructors, and students interact in order to create rich opportunities for uh, mathematics learning in post-secondary settings. Um, to do this, I have engaged in a process of characterizing various aspects of these interactions, and I will present them organized in three parts. And <clears throat> those are characterizations of instruction. Very briefly, I will talk about some studies that I have done on that front. Um, I will also talk about how I have found ways in which faculty use their textbooks when they are planning their lessons. And then at the end, I'm going to talk about the textbook use in and for teaching, which is this large grant. So um, what does instruction look like in post-secondary settings? So following uh, the definition of instruction by David Cohen, um, Steve Rodenbush, and Deborah Ball, many of you may know this uh, representation. I have operationalized instruction as the interactions between instructor, students, and content, which is a definition that allows me uh, a specific lens to attend to classroom activity. In earlier studies, I have used uh, very several level, level low inference codes or tallies. Uh, for one thing that I have done is uh, the turn, which is the speech that a speaker does before somebody interrupts that speaker or before that speaker gives the floor to another person. And I also have <clears throat> looked at high inference codes, including the cognitive demand of the tasks and the level of implementation of reform in the classrooms. And I say high inference because it's harder to ascertain fully, truly, that that's what's going on. So when observing many different types of classes from many uh, uh, institutions, we can take a look at these, one of these, um, these um, indices. So I have used the number of a student turns per minute in a lesson. So how many times there is a student speaking divided by the number of minutes of a lesson. So it's not very hard to do, it's not very hard to count. And in here I have put a couple of bubble uh, dots that show for uh, different types of, uh, can I, you can see my cursor moving there, like different types of courses. So I have studied uh, upper division university, first year university, first year honors university, and the dots that are here about remedial, at community courses that are remedial, were remedial at community colleges or pre-college courses, and then IBL courses. Um, mm, come on, and IBL means increased-based learning. So some of you may have already seen these, so you can already think what um, the other dots would look like, okay? Uh, so this is what the other dots look like. Um, uh, I don't think this is um, surprising. This is, includes data from over 50 lessons that um, are taken from different institutions. Uh, so it's not no, no surprise, I guess, that uh, in university the interaction is not as high as in other settings or even in inquiry-based learning settings. Okay. So using transcripts of lessons, we can also look at the number of words that are in a turn. So that's another thing that I have used in, the, in, in my studies. Um, so in this, in here, we can uh, see, for example, the, we can count the average number of words when instructors speak, so that's the instructor's turn, and the average number of words when students speak or the student turns. So you can also try to think on your head um, what do you think those numbers are? So that's one. And I also have looked at how many students actually produce turns that are between one and three words long, because those are very frequent. So the instructor asks a question, and the student says, yes, or two plus three. So that's a three-word turn. So those are very um, you know, common. We can recognize them. So this is what I have found. So instructors turn on average have 40 words on average in these lessons, whereas the student turns have on average between four and five words. However, when you look at the percentage of, uh, of uh, turns that have between one or three words, it's about 51%. So about half of the interactions of the responses that students provide in a class are between one and three words long. That doesn't happen in inquiry-based learning classes. 
Now you may be wondering, yeah, that's, those contents are great, but what about the quality? So in order to assess the quality, I have looked at the quality of the questions and problems by looking at the cognitive demand of the examples that are presented and the cognitive demand of the questions that are asked, and also at the level of reform and act. So looking at how much students are being asked to participate by in groups, individually, presenting at the board, or the representations that are used is more than symbolic. Do they use graphs? Do they use uh, words? Do they use tables? Do they use diagrams? Uh, the type of technology used is graphing calculator or just scientific calculator or uh, uh, computer algebra systems, animations, and the types of tasks solved. Are they oriented towards uh, just repeating a procedure, practicing a procedure, or are they oriented towards justification or proof or contextualizing in a real world uh, environment, et cetera? So those are the, the things that I, we have been looking at. So this is the quality, the uh, comparison of types of questions and proportions in both IBL courses and non-IBL courses. So it is more likely that the tasks are not as routine. So there are a few, there, in IBL classes, there are some routine tasks. We do expect students to learn some practical, develop some skill. And similarly with the questions. I mean, that is not surprising. But it's surprising though, maybe not surprising, that in non-IBL classes, this is not what happens. So the, the amount of space devoted in time to the tasks that are um, low cognitive demand routine is higher. When we look at, um, uh, what happens in reform. So what I'm showing here is a, what we call the maps on lessons in calculus. And what we have here is the level of involvement. This is the first column. The types of representations used, the tasks, the type of tasks used, and the type of technology used. And this is work we have developing uh, with Nina White, have been developing with Nina White, and she came up with this representation, and I always like to show it, because it is visually shows several things. First, um, the, in this class, there were only three problems solved, and one, there was a lot of student involvement. That's the high, the gray color means is the business as usual, and higher coloring means there is a little bit more of activity, more excitement. And so in this lesson that had only three problems, about seven minute, 70 minutes long, there was um, a little bit of involvement here of the students and some involvement in the last activity, in the last task. In, the, in this side, on contrast, we have about 73 minutes, it's a little bit longer, but then we have more activity, okay? So you see some of these features represented. So when you have an aggregation of lessons, like we have 66 lessons, then you can say a little bit more information. So um, what we found is, and these are lessons part of the National Study of Calculus. So what we found is that student involvement, uh, excuse me, student involvement was not very high. So most common thing was to see the student presenting or students working individually at their desks. Uh, we also saw mostly using symbolic representation with another representation. So two representations was the most common, which is probably uh, this lighter color here for representation, that there was uh, the symbolic plus another one. And uh, we also saw um, uh, the features of the text, the task mostly were uh, geared toward developing a skill. And we saw very little uh, technology use, although I, we believe that's part of how we designed the study and how we collected the data. So that technology column is not necessarily representative of what was happening. So, so these studies, uh, illustrate the kind of interactions that occur, occur in a cross-section of mathematics classrooms that I have observed. These descriptions are tied to courses observed. They may be not generalizable, but they resonate with experience, experiences many of us have had. So now I'm moving into the second part of my presentation, stepping outside of the classroom so I can briefly present what I have learned about how instructors use their textbook for planning. So this is going to get a little bit technical. Forgive me, I'm gonna try to <laughs> not bore you with the details, but uh, I think it's useful to have a little bit of a uh, framing for what I'm gonna say. So, um, so we know that textbooks are fundamental for the work that we do, uh, both uh, instructors and students. They are everywhere, we require them, they are expensive, we talk about them all the time. But there are very few studies that investigate that relationship between this, the instructor and the textbook. 
And uh, we are curious, I mean, I'm curious, how does the textbook mediate the student, the teacher's work, and how can textbooks be used to change instruction? So um, I'm using here uh, Vygotsky's definition of human activity that he says that activity, human activity is solely mediated by tools. I'm using here tools in more loose uh, sense of objects. And also using Robert Dell and Verilon who proposed that instrumented activity uh, is, me, is what we do and that instruments have uh, uh, two parts. First, the object. Um, and also a way of using the object. So an instrument is in reality an object or an, an artifact that you have attached a use to it. So if you think about a butter knife, it is used to spread butter, but you can also use it to screw a loose, screw, a, a tire screw loose. So it's a different use, the same instrument, but it's the same artifact, same object, but different instrumentations. So you may wonder, well, a textbook is always used for planning. <laughs> so what are the different instrumentations that may happen there? Okay, so, so there are a few instrumentations. So um, first of all, the instructor is interested in using the textbook to plan the course. Second, the instructor is also using, interested in using the textbook to make sure the students do something, <laughs> right? And also the instructor by, by virtue of using the textbook is learning something about the textbook, what is informing their practice or learning something new that they didn't know before. I'm gonna talk about only the second one. So <clears throat> uh, we have asked faculty to tell us how do your students use your textbook, the mathematic textbook in class. So according to the faculty, um, there are two images, and I'm, I'm saying here, two images of the students. In one, uh, one image is the image of the undergraduate, and the other is the image of the math student. So according to the faculty, the undergraduate student starts with the homework. If things don't work out, they will go out and read the examples, and if the examples don't help out, they will read the expository text. In contrast, they say the math student reads the expository text before attempting the problems. So I ask, okay, uh, how do you plan your lessons? So this is what, how they go about generating the lessons for these two groups of students. This is a long quote, I am highlighting what I want you to pay attention to. So, so uh, for an undergrad instructor, say, I tend to look at the exercises, say, okay, which I find interesting, which I want students to be able to do. I select the problems I think are useful and ask questions. And then I base my lectures on those. And if I need something else, then you know, go back in the text, make a new example, et cetera, okay? What does the planning look like for uh, math, a math, math student? So this is what they say. I go through the theory that's being presented by the test. I take the test much more seriously. I actually read through the textbook. I read the book. If they are going to prove why they do that, because if they were doing a different proof, they want to know about that proof. So then you see also how the way in which instructors are planning also is predicated in this perception of how the students are using the book. So the question again is how can textbooks be used as levers? Is it possible? It is possible. So what I have shown at this at, up to this point is that it's, it's possible to document how resources um, that the instructors use mediate their pedagogical activity. And I have hinted a little bit of things that happen in that mediation, um, which is the second bullet in this slide. It could be instrumented in multiple ways and it depends on the constraints of the course. So because there are mandates to what content to teach, right? Um, there may be an institutional determination that you have to devote one day a week to do certain things. That means that you not be able to cover content. Uh, do you need, you need to know whether the course is a standalone course, is the last in the sequence, is the first in the sequence. And also, um, you also need to attend to what the authors are telling you and also what the students need and what the colleagues are saying about the book. So all those things play a role in how you instrument uh, the textbook. Okay, well now I'm going into the third part of the talk, which is about the project, um, which is a collaborative project between the American Institute of Mathematics and um, the University of Puget Sound with Rob Beezer, who is right here in the front, and uh, David Farmer, who is also there, and Kent, Morrison was right there from the American Institute of Mathematics. And Tom Judson from Stephen F. Austin is here. 
He's just waving like this. And then we have Susan Lenz and Megan Littrell from the University of Colorado who are our, our evaluators. So this is a large scale study and of instructors and students using three textbooks. That's, that's what it is. There's no more than that. Uh, these are special books. They are open source. They are open access. They are written in pretext, which is part of why they are open source and open access. <laughs> and they have many embedded features, reading questions. I'm going to show some of these uh, in the presentation. What we computational cells using Sage, GeoGebra or JavaScripts that integrate and allow students to navigate and play, and web work. We're calling these dynamic textbooks, and we're making this distinction from the literature that has another characterization of electronic books, because this is just a book, it's not a printed, well, anyway. So we are calling them dynamic for our purposes. Um, so I'm going to show now is some screenshots of the features of these textbooks. And the reason I decided to use screenshots is that if I start navigating, I will eat all up my time. So, okay, here's for references, the textbooks that we're using, Matt Belkins, who is over there somewhere. Yeah, here. Um, <coughs> Active Calculus and Rob Beeser's first course in linear algebra and Tom Judson's uh, abstract algebra. And you can find other textbooks in the AIM website. So, um, so here is the abstract, the front page of the abstract algebra book, and I only want to point out a couple of things. Um, it's a nice look. It's a very clean look. You can click all these things and go back and forth. You can, you know, it's very standard in that way, but it's very easy to navigate. Um, you can, uh, because it's open source, uh, some people have found it and they already translated into Spanish. So it's being used at the University of Chile. Right? right now, because it's open source. And it's just this is the version that was just updated, <laughs> like two weeks ago. So this is very different from the standard publishing process that we have with the big, large, com large companies. And this is something very appealing for us. Okay? So that's uh, that. Um, then this is a, a screenshot of the, abstract, the linear algebra textbook. And in here, I am showing only the uh, Sage cell. So there is a Sage cell with some commands there and some evaluation. And I actually, this morning, changed this number, <laughs> took the screenshot, because you can interact with them. And then you get something else. And I know that Rob is looking, what? Did you change it? Anyway, so it will be generated. It's fine. But there is, that is a level of interaction, right, there. And here I'm showing a little bit of the Active Calculus book. Uh, so it has uh, something that's called the preview activities. And what is interesting, this is, this is part of our research study. We added this dimension to our books. Uh, so uh, there is a question, and there is a question there, and there is a box, and I need to do something. So I type these, but I need to continue answering. So I will answer something, and I continue answer. And when I'm finished as a student, I will submit my answers, and then my teacher will have all the answers, my answers, and all of the answers of my, my peers in my classroom. Okay, so those are examples of features that we have in this book. So the questions are, how do instructors and use, the students use these textbooks when they teach and learn? And how can these features support instructional change? So the design uh, is really various cycle, cycles of research development and implementation. So we have, uh, co we are collecting a lot of data that is um, in real time with the students and the teachers using these books. We use that information uh, to feed the development portion, and they take their feedback about the features, about the use, they made some changes, and then we put them in the book, and then our faculty are quote unquote trained to use them, and then we observe how they use them, and we <laughs> start over again. Uh, this is uh, the various realms of data collection have this scheme, so we have uh, the top panel indicates the data we're collecting from faculty, so surveys once at the beginning of the semester, something we call the logs, which is basically, tell me what, are, what is going on in your class every two weeks or so. What did you do? Why did you do that, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the syllabi, their lecture notes, uh, and they are invited to attend a workshop in the summer. Some, of, some faculty are invited to attend a workshop in the summer. And they also have computer-generated student and teacher data 
that looks, I'm, I'm gonna wait on how that looks like because I wanna talk about the other areas. We also have campus visits for a small group in which we observe the faculty, video record them, we interview them, we attend how they plan, how they teach, we talk to the students, so it's a, uh, we collect data and, that way, and we have learned a lot about that process. The students also complete logs, they also complete a survey in the middle of the semester and they take two tests of knowledge in each course. A, towards the beginning of the semester and at the ends of the semester. And one of the outcomes that we have is the gain in that <clears throat> test. And we also have grades. So our goal is to collect data from 49 sections from 40 teachers distributed in these courses. So um, let me show you what is uh, this thing here, the computer generated student data. So because the textbooks are written in pretext, we can actually capture how the students are viewing the book. So whenever they click, we magically somewhere is stored an information about what they clicked. So here on the left are the sections of the book and when they click. So this is at the top is a time frame. So this is what we can see. Uh, and we have a scale here from little use on the left and high use on the right. So you can see in this course, that was a linear algebra class, you know, the instructor started teaching a, maybe here an exam, right? <laughs> and then nothing here. Maybe there was a break, a spring break or something like that. And then a lot of use towards the end. Of it. So, so we're trying to look at that. But then another thing that these representation allow, these uh, pretext allows us to do is collect individual users. So here is a snapshot. When I click one of those little rectangles, I get a snapshot of what is going on in there. So here you'll see a, a bunch of colors, right? And I'm really interested in one student here, this particular student. So this is a student. And then in the log, we ask the student, okay, tell me what were you doing at that time? And why do we do that? Because the computer only captures the viewing. It doesn't tell me what is in the viewing. So I need to find information about that and we need to make sure that that is real, true information about how they are viewing the textbook. All right, so far uh, we have collected five rounds of 10 uh, planned uh, sessions. I am including the prior, prior uh, grant <clears throat> uh, from 27 faculty. So here is just a snapshot of all the data we have been collecting halfway through. So and we have done a number of analyses. Um, so uh, let me see what is here. Yeah. So uh, we have looked at the competencies in textbooks, meaning what are these textbooks striving for? We have done that for one book, one big chapter. What are the competencies that this book is striving for? And in which features of these textbooks those competencies are? And the next part is looking at student use and compare of those features, which competencies they are using, you know, they are getting better at because they are using, using those features. Uh, so that's one analysis that we're interested in doing. The other is the documents instructors create. I'm going to show data on that. Uh, resources used by instructors and students, uses of textbook and, and their features, student performance, and there are many more that are not here, uh, but that can be done because of the uh, immense data set that we have. So I'm going to talk about all these only. So here, the first slide is a uh, instructor, how instructors create lecture notes. So on the, um, we have here the lecture notes um, and how they are connecting them to the textbook. So we have organized them from what I, shot, I, I just call these the less dynamic to the more dynamic. So there are instructors who handwrite their notes on paper or on a tablet or on a PDF and um, one bullet, they may just have bullet points or they're really full text. And the kinds of things that they take from the textbook include direct references, like direct copying directly a definition, uh, or making sure that the notation matches. So that is uh, a thing that they, something that they do. Another we've seen is that instructors create online videos of the textbook. So because they want to quote unquote flip their classroom, they read the textbook, they read the important parts, they upload the video, and then in class, the students talk about that and discuss that. And the reference of, to the textbooks, of course, whole sections of the textbooks are read. Uh, there are practice problems that they use from the textbooks and in problem sheets in the classroom. 
They also use, of course, we saw a lot of Beamer and PowerPoints that are very convenient for the presentations. They allow us instructors to include links and copy text directly. Rather than copying, they just link and open the textbook and everything is there. So it's a little bit more convenient. And we have also uh, examples of people who have created pretext worksheets that they distribute to the students. So a pretext worksheet generated in the same form that has sage and computation and things like that. Um, now, how in the classroom what we have seen? So, uh, um, have a first column of what the instructor, how the instructor is using the textbook in the classroom, and how the students are using the textbook in the classroom. We, I call here from less to more dynamic for lack of a better word. I actually don't like necessarily think that this is appropriate, but anyway. So, the instructor usually. Um, so these are things that we have observed. Instructor actually writes on the board the notes that they have on paper. Um, they may or may not check the book during class, or they, but they usually assign tasks that are from the textbook. So those are the links that we have seen. In those classes, the students usually copy on their notebooks or listen, uh, may or may not check the textbook, and use the textbook for uh, tasks and references. We also have seen project notes, so like the faculty projecting their notes. So the notes are on the board and they are going one by one, demonstrating them. The students will may, may have access to those on printed and they will annotate them. That's, and as I said before in the slide, the kinds of links that appear, so that's how they connect to the book. Um, and they may assign text from textbooks or use for references. They may also discuss reading questions. So they assign, so uh, I showed you very briefly, we got those reading questions, so the instructor may come to class and say, okay, these are the responses, let's talk about that. And they may assign some textbook tasks that are embedded in the task to solve in the classroom, or may follow links that are needed. The students will respond to the reading questions and use the textbooks for tasks of reference and follow the links. And we also have seen faculty creating and demonstrating animations and programming. So they may have some code and they show how to code in Sage, et cetera, and then the students also do that in the classroom. Now, what resources do you use? We have asked these faculty, to faculty, because it's interesting, like uh, we, I'm, I'm focusing mostly on textbook, but textbook is really, a, you know, there are more than textbooks, like we use more things than textbooks when we are teaching. So, because this grant is about the textbooks, that's what I ask, but I also ask what other things do you use? So what do you be, think through how you, as an instructor, the kinds of resources that you have, uh, you have used? And I'll show you what we have found in our study. <clears throat> so, of course, the textbook, they are part of our project, <laughs> so I have to use our textbook. Although not everybody has used our textbook. Even though they are assigning our project and they are assigning a, a book, they may not use it, but that's okay. Um, there are notes that they used before, textbooks they used when they were students, the student's body language that is very common for us to hear, that that is an important resource for them. Uh, also, the questions that they ask. Uh, other textbooks not that they found in the library of new textbook that somebody sent them. They use Sage, Mathematica, Desmos, colleagues, family, and the internet. What would be your guess about the students? All right. So this is what we have found, uh, the textbook. They use the textbook, both formats. And I am gonna say the formats is interesting. We assign uh, faculty to a particular format, meaning you have to use an identical copy of the book that is on PDF, has all the features, except a few, you know, the links, they not necessarily work the same, but all the other features are available. And Almost in every single section that we have observed, we have transfers, like people who are assigned to the PDF, but they're using the HTML, and people who are using the HTML. So it is an interesting thing, it's a confining, I mean, really making us, making it harder for us to analyze the data, but it's real, that's the reality. Um, so they use a lot of Google and Wolfram Alpha and Chegg. They actually, uh, we had a, a student told us that they take the question that the instructor gives and the instructor thinks that this is a very novel question. They just put it in Google and they go from there. Uh, YouTube and Khan Academy mention a lot. Uh, Sage, Mathematica, Desmos, GeoGebra, other HTML textbooks, other bounded textbooks, students who took the course, the instructor, 
and family. So I am ranking them also in the frequency in which they mention those, right? Um, and and um, in this time and age, I don't think we should be surprised about this because technology is everywhere. We are you know, using technology everywhere. So the question for us is how do I take advantage of this information <laughs> for, my, for my planning and my courses? Okay, so how do um, they use the textbook? So for here, this is uh, data from the survey from two, the last two waves of data collection, the spring 19 and the fall 19. So we have some features, some elements of the textbook definitions, examples, theorems, proofs. And on the top, we have the, tip, the type of activity. Because remember, the textbook um, has a mediating role depending on the activity. So that's what we're interested in understanding, right? So in here, I'm going to highlight a couple of things. Uh, this is ordered in um, the frequency of use across all these activities. And it's interesting that definitions come up, comes up first, because that's not what we think. We think that it's homework problems that comes up first. So it's not, and why it's not? Because the students are using the textbook in many other activities as they are in our classes, okay? Um, and it's interesting, so doing homework, of course, uh, studying for exams, of course, preparing for class less so, uh, during class. When, and we have a column of don't use because that allows us to see the extent to which students are actually being honest with us. They don't have any, uh, obligation towards us. And I am always happy when somebody says, I don't like the textbook, I don't use it, I use something else. Because that tells me that my questions are actually prompting something from them to be honest with me. Uh, another thing, of course, homework problems, which is the first thing that I thought. It is the highest percentage though, 87%. So it's, that's the highest percentage across the table, but it's mostly used for doing homework. And then not much for anything, I mean, not relative to the other things, not much, right? And I also want to highlight this triad. Definitions, examples, and theorems are very important when they are studying for exam. Okay. Now, I want to see how that compares with the viewing data. Remember those heat maps? Um, so I, I need to apologize because the data I'm going to show is not from these waves. <laughs> because uh, we don't have the data yet. But this is from a different wave that paints similar contrasting um, um, view. So the students use the, view the books or the textbooks during class session, close to exam days, and when homework is due. And in here you see the time that is spent um, mostly on viewing solutions to problems. And uh, this is an example. So they look at the examples and look at the solutions, and they, they do other things. Okay. Uh, in terms of uh, clicks, how much time they click, because that's different. One thing is how much they click and how much time they spend. So this is a, it's a slightly different proportion. So it gives us a sense of how much time they are spending relative to each other. Okay. So in summary, Students and instructors instrument their textbook in many ways. So there are no, we haven't found really big qualitative differences between PDF or HTML faculty, which um, is very interesting for us. Um, we have found um, faculty themselves who use both versions. It's not just students, also faculty who use both, uh, very comfortable. Um, and I, I think that's for me, that's great. <laughs> it makes me wonder about all these things. Um, then uh, we also have found that the same textbooks, as I just tried to illustrate here, is being instrumented very differently by students of the same instructor. So it is, it is not surprising that if you are in a different college from mine, and you're using the same book, I may be using the book very differently from you. But what is interesting is that within a class, the students actually find a wide range of ways of using their textbook. Um, there is, uh, the instructors also integrate the textbook into their usual ways of planning and enacting instruction as they respond to institutional and disciplinary constraints. And this is one of the most important points I want you to go home with. Because uh, it's not that, um, it's not that, we are interested in classifying our teachers that they are not using, they're not, they're no user, adopters or not, I'm not interested in that as much as um, a lot, trying to understand how is that this is happening. So you may uh, be familiar with this 
um, arguments about why is that the change is so slow, why is that we don't see more of it in classrooms, even though we have so much information. And the usual argument runs through these bullets in here. So the instructor has some knowledge or of mathematics or of pedagogy or of curriculum or some beliefs or some attitudes or some expectations or uh, some motivations or the working conditions are really bad or in inadequate, incompatible with what we want to do. So sure, but I think that is a very simple answer to this issue. So I, I take a different uh, role. Um, position on that, and this is what I'm why I'm interested in looking at these things. So I, I see uh, uh, instructors and students as individuals that are in a specific role in any given moment in time. So you are a teacher here, but sometimes when you go and talk to a student, you become a different kind of teacher because you need to understand something else that's going on. Or you look at the clock and you realize that you have 30 seconds, and you didn't get to the, car, to the end of the lesson. So you have to make hard decisions there. So what I'm saying is the individuals in this, and the students do the same. So for individuals in these roles will respond to pressures or obligations towards the institution, towards the discipline, towards the class as a whole, and to individual students, okay? And they make those decisions in the situation so that I don't use my reading questions as um, Tom on, on David, <laughs> wrong one them to use, doesn't mean that I don't think that there is value in it. It may be that for this particular class or this particular setting, that's not the best option, okay? So, um, okay, next steps. Um, uh, so, so what I like about these frameworks allows me to see more holistically what's going on. Um, so the next steps, of course, uh, we want to improve on some experiments that we have done with natural language algorithms to process all the data from logs that we are collecting. Because imagine how many students every, semester, uh, every little time are, are um, responding to these prompts that we have, and we have many students, and we have a lot of data. We are training an algorithm right now, and we are gonna try it with a new data set and see whether it will behave. That will help a lot in processing the data. Um, we're developing a way to identify patterns of viewing. If you remember, there were some that were like this in that, but there are some that are more jagged. And we are really curious, oh, let's find out what are those, are, this, are those common, who are doing them, when are doing them, the same idea with the activities. Um, we are trying to also work on the connection of all these various types of data because they are very giving us different information, but we still, we know that we can link them, but we haven't uh, done that yet. So it's a big enterprise. And we're also interested in determining the association with the student outcomes. Student in courses in which the textbook supports student interaction in classes with the content seem to be gaining more in the students of student knowledge, independently of the book. So what we have been seeing is that when instructors go to the classroom and engage the students some way with the textbook, talking to each other, presenting at the board, doing the solution, uh, following some links, they do a slightly better. Unfortunately, we don't have enough data for that because um, it's even though we have a lot of data, we don't have enough. <laughs> so that's the paradoxes of educational research. So in conclusion, um, the textbook is not the only resource that we have. Knowledge of the uses of resources is also something that we can use. Um, the ways in which the textbook is used is not just a matter of individual preference. And I want to emphasize that. It's not that I really like this. It's, there is more behind. When you decide not to use certain things, there is more behind that decision. Maybe convenience, but convenience is always be, uh, uh, in the forefront of other reasons why you may not engage in using certain features in the textbook. Um, there are promising features that can prompt slight changes in everyday practice, and that's, uh, that's one of the things that we're looking at, these uh, motivating questions or reading questions on the interaction. Um, and we really want to know how that particular resource is instrumented, because that's what matters more. It's not necessarily that these resources have all these features, but that you can use them in certain ways. Um, I think that's, yeah, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, we still have a few minutes for questions. 
And there are microphones around the room, and please go to a microphone so that you can be heard by everyone in the room. Thank you for such a wonderful talk. It's very intriguing. I'm very interested in this, this type of methods. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I am wondering, uh, in an era of uh, feed bands and Apple watches, you know, <laughs> um, in which I, I was personally very skeptical of measuring my sleep and those kind of <laughs> things. It feels a little invasive. But then I started seeing, when I saw the graphs of the sleep cycles, um, in which you know I could be in bed for eight hours, but really the quality of sleep recorded was like five hours. And then there were intervals with a color code of deep sleep and mm -hmm. other stages. Mm -hmm. And that kind of, when I saw your heat map, it reminded me of those type of measurements. Mm -hmm. Um, so early on you had a slide where you had university, community college, and mm -hmm. uh, remedial, and those mm -hmm. kind of things. Um, I'm wondering how we can best use some of these tools, uh, hopefully also implementations with adaptive learning mm -hmm. or with some type of customized, you know, where the learning process is customized to the learning curve of that individual. I think ultimately that's how you would like to use this in some type of artificial intelligence, you know, fashion to, to best provide quality of instruction for each individual. But I'm specifically interested in pathways and college readiness, because I see, and I know this is always a challenge of how to transition people from developmental into college algebra into calculus. Uh, and I see that once we make them be successful at making it to calculus, they can finish their chemistry, physics, computer science. So there is like at least eight STEM occupations that you know we, we could expand the number of students majoring and completing degrees. So I look at the national enrol uh, national enrollment trends and enrollment trends in under at the undergraduate level. And for five consecutive years, they're low. They, they're not just low, they are, we're losing undergraduate students, which tells me that not only the enrollment is bad, the graduation rate is gonna be pathetic as well, and in, in, in just a few years from now, which means that supply and demand, you know, there are a lot of more jobs in physical sciences, in mathematics and engineering, and there will be fewer people with, with qualifications to fill these jobs. And I think these type of methods, these type of metrics, could, could be very useful for placing more students in STEM, hmm. you know, in STEM majors? Well, yeah, um, thank you for that question. I think, um, if, um, I think that was part of the goal, part of the, you know, the reason that these books exist. And I, I didn't mention, this is just the research, the educational research component of the project, because the, comp the project also has the development of these tools so it's a more technical aspect, and it also has a part that curates the textbook. So there is, it's a very complex project, and I'm only in charge of the educational research part. And part of the impetus is that the textbooks are really expensive. People cannot afford these textbooks. So why are we giving the money to you know, the publisher companies when we can just forego that and charge a very different scale fee to, for example, support this uh, interaction between the, me and my students. So, like they will give me my, my responses. In some cases we can connect this with Sage and then they can do wonderful things. So that's a little bit of the interest in opening, broadening access for students. Um, we, in our sample, we are recruiting actively uh, institutions that are uh, serving minority students or underrepresented students in the STEMs, uh, in the STEM and community colleges, because we want to understand how those textbooks work. In terms of whether, uh, how, how far we will be moving the needle, I don't know, your analogy about the smart watches is very appropriate, because that's exactly what we wrestle with. What are the kinds of things that can match people in doing things a little bit different because they're having a lot of information right away? We, we are, not there yet, but we have some tools, so we need to play more with the data in order to provide some representations that could match the faculty in doing that. Vilma, thank you for a, oh. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, so my question, uh, mostly just clarifying, but you had um, the chart that had the ways that the students are using the textbooks, uh, definitions, examples, theorems, et cetera, and then you had the pie chart, which had the solutions and the examples as kind of the majority. Was the first chart um, student self-reporting? The first one is self-reporting in a survey in the middle of the semester. Okay. And um, yes, and it, unfortunately, and I, that's what I, uh, my caveat was that they don't belong to the same group of students. So mm -hmm. that's why some of the proportions look off. But we need to do that analysis in order to see how off they are. Because I don't think they are very off. That's the, but I don't know. I have to do the analysis. So they are actually, we are seeing some of the things they say. Oh, yeah, that's happening here in the viewing data. Thank you for that. Last question. Thank you uh, for a great talk. I was curious in all of this, how or if at all you're able to look at students like reading the mathematics um, within the textbook? Yes. So we haven't. <laughs> And we would love to do it. <laughs> so the only thing that we have been able to do now is being uh, more effective at telling them, telling for them to tell us what exactly are they doing. So because initially we, this is a two-year project that took us two years to get to a point in which we're happy with the questions that we ask. So we ask, how do you use the text? Oh, I read it. What do you mean? Oh yeah, so we re re reviewed the questions. and uh, So now we have a, an interesting scheme. We're using cartoon animations and the maps and say, well, okay, yes, you read the book, but that means that did you start from the beginning? Did you scan? Did you skim? Did you underline? Did you copy in somewhere else? So we have now a large, uh, I should have brought that up, I forgot, uh, a large list of verbs of actions that really expand. When they say, yes, I use the book, it's a really long list. So some, they, some of them say, I reverse engineer the problem. So, so when I get a problem, it's wrong. And then I go back and then go step by step backwards to see where is that I did the mistake. So I have a much better, we have a much better set of um, examples of how they're using. We don't have reading data, but we are hopeful that with the analysis of the student responses to the reading questions, we may understand really well how they are reading by virtue of reading what they wrote. So when they write something that is not necessarily exactly what we thought they were reading, and we have 40 students doing the same, then it's like, oh, okay, maybe there's some misconception that needs to be clarified, or there is something in the textbook that is leading students to do this. We are not there yet, and we're not there yet because this is the first semester we're collecting data on the, the first year, on the reading questions, <laughs> so, and not everybody uses that, you know, so, yeah. Thank you for your question. Well, I believe we're out of time, but Vilma is around if you have any future questions for her. Thank you very much.